Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, it is 11. Morning. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and I'm sure people will continue to come in, which is completely fine. Um, hi and welcome to map your data story using data to ensure student success. My name is Sochil Tirado and I am a faculty mentor with CVC and a faculty member DE coordinator at Imperial Valley College. Um, I'm pleased to introduce you to a wonderful facilitator, Christella Button, which is here with us right now. Um, she is a former secondary English ESL teacher and PK-12 instructional coach. She now works at Diablo Valley College as an instructional designer and computer information science instructor. Her focus is on online accessibility and equitable course design, allows her to support instructors as they create innovative and inclusive learning spaces in all modalities. She finds teaching to be an awesome adventure, helping her put her work's focus into practice and reminding her that there is always something to learn, even if you are the teacher. During the webinar, we will also be linking to a survey for you to provide feed feedback. We'll be dropping in the link about every 30 minutes or so, so look out for it. We ask that you fill this out to let us know how we did and so we can create programming that is more tailored to the needs of our system moving forward. Lastly, while at one bag offers badges as proof of completion for our courses, we do not provide a badge for attending this webinar. However, if your institution requires proof of attendance for flex credit or professional advancement, please remain until the end of the webinar, complete a survey, and request a copy of your response to be sent to you through the Google form. You can use that confirmation as your proof of attendance. So without further ado, I am going to go ahead and hand it off to Christella. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining me on a Friday. I really appreciate it. And I know some of you are on spring break, so even more appreciation for that. Um, we had ours quite early this year, so we are already back in action at DVC. But um, And thank you for the introduction. I'm Christella Button. I am, as mentioned, a instructional designer at Diablo Valley College. Um, and I'm excited to share this topic with you today. Um, I did put a link to the slides in the chat. If you'd like to join along, feel free. Um, and I'll try my best to drop that in there a few more times. But um, I also have it on my slides here. So i go ahead and start. Okay. So welcome. Um, this is a focused presentation mostly on data, but also touching on my favorite topics, which are accessibility um, and equity and design. And I do work a lot with um, other, our peer online mentor, or well, we call it peer online mentorship, but it is our peer online course review program. So a lot of what we have here today is stuff that we use to ensure that our courses are um, aligned to the CBC rubric and are equitable for all students to access. So feel free to follow along either using the link or you can scan the QR code if you are using your mobile device, if you'd like. Um, so just, I know there's already an introduction, but a little bit about me, I'm Crystala. Um, feel free to email me if you have any questions. I put my email address on the slide for you. Um, but I am an instructional designer by trade, and then I also work part-time as an instructor um, at DVC in our computer information systems program. Uh, but I did spend most of my time teaching high school, a lot of English, ESL, and a little bit of theater in there as well. Um, and I found myself through technology in Google certification. So when I was teaching in the classroom, um, Google certification was like a new thing and I really got into it. And then that's when I started using more technology um, and really started to learn about accessibility, course design and um, data usage. So what I love most about course design is not only accessibility, but also equitable design for learning. So some of you may have heard of universal design. We'll talk a little bit about that today um, and then technology integration with that. And then I like to live by the phrase guide on the side there is a lovely phrase um, that I've seen a lot at a lot of K-12 trainings, but um, moving from that sage on the stage to the guide on the side is really how I um, draft my courses and teach 
uh, online and in person. So happy to share a little bit about what I like to do with you today. Um, so our agenda for today, we I really want to start everything that I do with equity. What is equity and how does it fulfill what we're doing, what our focus is? And today that's data. So how do we ensure data equity and accessibility as we begin to collect and review? Um, so we'll learn a little bit about how we can write our own or outline our own um, data. And then we're going to talk about data in equitable terms, um, satellite map and street data. And that may be new to you. And I'm, I would love to introduce you to speaking about data in that way. So we'll talk a little bit about the research behind that and then how that leads to data equity as we get into a couple of data points that we can control and we can begin to research through Canvas and other formative assessments. As we are participating today, feel free if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand. Please utilize the chat. Um, we've got a couple of folks helping out in the chat today, but I'm also um, checking the chat so that I can answer questions. Um, we'll have a couple of points where we stop and start to draft our story, and that's a really great opportunity to unmute and ask questions or raise your hand, um, clarify things. Um, and it's always nice to see reactions too. So if you like something that you hear or you like a comment in the chat, please feel free to use those emojis, react, um, let everybody know what your thoughts are while the presentation is happening so that we can um, keep up with where you're at. So let's start. Um, so I want to design this in a way as we're telling a story. So we'll start with our pre-writing. If you've ever written a story, hopefully you've probably started by little notes, bullet points, things like that. Our bullet points this time are gonna be equity and accessibility. So how do we start with data and keep equity and accessibility in mind? Um, as we build our assessments and we begin to collect data or you likely have already collected some data this semester, we want to think about possible change makers that we can implement that will ensure success based on the data that we're reading. So what type of materials have we given to our students? Um, are they a diverse reflection of our students and their experiences? Are they real world experiences, things that maybe they would have seen when they walk out that classroom door or leave your canvas shell? Are they able to apply the experience and material to the real world, regardless of what the topic is? How many formative data points are they allowed in, in your course? How much casual data are you collecting? And that could be a quick check-in. It could be a short survey, an anonymous survey. But what are those data points that you have collected to inform you before you reteach? And then how can we begin to decenter traditional grading systems and allow students ownership over their own learning? And that's a big topic and we'll touch just a little bit on it today, but at one has some great programs about um, rethinking your, your grading programs that you can um, check out next. So one of those ways that we can begin to diversify our traditional grading is by allowing for student voice and choice in the projects or the assignments or assessments that they participate in. So they can choose the outcome or they can choose what it looks like. Um, they can show you how they best learn this topic based on whatever it is that they're learning. We can implement grade goals, which is another way for students to participate in the grade that they're receiving. They can respond, they can ask questions, they can start to cross things off their list as they move down the line and learn a new topic. Um, and this is a great formative piece of data for an instructor to take a look at and say, oh, okay, now I understand why they turned this in instead of this, because they've written their grade goal statement and I see where their head was at. And that leads right to student-led conferences, things that we can start to implement to start talking to our students about their assignments and talking to them about the grades that they're receiving or would like to receive and get a little bit more information about them as a whole student um, before we just count it as a data point. Um, and all of these things really lead to universal design for learning. So here we have, um, what what it means to institute a little bit more extra care in our course design. So are we allowing students different ways to access materials? Are we allowing students um, 
a bridge to their learning. So I use the wheelchair example only because we have students or we have sidewalks that we have created that have that wheelchair ramp, but it's not just people in a wheelchair who use it. Although we think about our folks who we wanna support who are disabled to use that, but also people with strollers, people who are carrying large amounts of boxes or, or need an extra entrance in. So when we start thinking about universal design, we are thinking about how can we create extra entrances? How can we build our materials in a way in which students can enter that learning from whichever direction they're headed, going to, coming from? Um, and when we create that, we are allowing students to have authentic learning experiences, which then produces more strong data for us, more data that will guide us to what students really need. They're feeling more connected. They're feeling more vulnerable about their learning. And then we can really start to see what is it that they need? What can we start to build or access for our students um, once we give them that voice and choice, once we give them that access point through UDL? Um, so how does all of that affect data? Because it does sound kind of like you know, this is a more about design, right? Well, all of these design elements can affect the data outcome that we have in our class. So this can allow us to examine what barriers exist. Let's say we take a traditional assessment. We just have a test that we, we've asked our students 10 questions. We can take a look at the way that those questions were written to see what answers our students gave. And then maybe from there understand, were there some missing pieces of information? What are the variables there? And then maybe what barriers, maybe accidental barriers that we've created in writing question types like this, and how can we begin to recreate or reassess so that we can allow all students to access the material in the same way. Um, and then we also look to desegregate the data. So we want to uh, offer an opportunity for us to take a look at data and desegregate the numbers, desegregate our students and really get down to the deep understanding. And I, I put in a quote in here from civilrights.org because I thought it did a better job of defining um, data inequities than I can. And so I, I do want to honor that and I'm gonna read that out loud so that we can um, learn a little bit more about it. So to tackle the many inequities in our society, we need data that is complete, accurate and desegregated. Desegregation means collecting and reporting on subgroups such by race, ethnicity, gender, and age, so that data accurately reflect reality for student subgroups of people. If we look at our overall data, we're not necessarily seeing our students. And that could mean district-wide, campus-wide, or even class-wide data. We're not actually seeing that student. We're seeing data points. So the goal today is to really learn how to peel that apart and take a look at our students as learners, as people, as the whole student and support them where they are at with what they need by using universal design to build an assessment that acknowledges all of those other things and gets down to that real student as close as we can. Because um, when we desegregate, we see really what's missing consistently over time. We'll begin to be able to notice those things. So we are going to prepare to write our story. Um, I will pause really quick to see if there are any questions before we move on to the next part. So, okay. Um, let's take a look. So I have one more, um, link I'm going to put in the chat really quick. So this is our story writing document. So the link that I just put in the chat is a link for you to download. If you want to download it into a Word document, feel free. Um, or you can also make a copy of it. Um, if you are familiar with and use Google Drive, feel free to hit file, make a copy. Or you can use this link, which is a direct copy link as well. Um, so we're going to write, and I'm not expecting you to like write a novel. 
This is really just for you to take notes. If you choose to take some notes on it, fantastic. If you're already taking notes on something else, that is totally fine as well. But this is just here to guide you. So we'll take a look at what is. Um, we've got a few chapters we're going to write today. We're going to brainstorm a little bit, get some notes out there, and then even write a little bit of an epilogue as we get towards the end of the learning today. So we're starting with equitable data because that's what we just learned a little bit about. And we want to start thinking about what, what is the data that I have access to? What, what even can I look at? And how can I begin to think about equity in reference to that data? And then we're going to start talking about summative assessments, which might be a new turn of phrase for you. And we'll learn a little bit about what is that and how can I ensure that I know how to find that data. And then more assessment data through Canvas and um, your own formative assessments that you've created. Um, so let's start with chapter one. Uh, map your map your data for equity and student success. This is where we're going to take a little bit uh, of a deeper look at actual data points. Like, what does it mean to locate and understand data? So, I would like to introduce you to the phrase "street data." It's likely something that you have not heard at the higher education level, um, and because it came from actually elementary school, that's where I learned about it when I was doing some curriculum coaching. And it is a fantastic concept that we should definitely be looking at in higher ed. So I'm hoping that this will be a really good place to start. Um, it offers us a space for us to look at the different levels of data that we have access to. We have a lot of data points, especially district-wide, that sometimes can be really overwhelming. We have district-wide data that tells us student success rates. We have data about courses that are aligned via the CVC. We have data about courses that um, are being built or courses that are under review or courses that are in-person versus online, hybrid. There's just a lot of data points that are happen district-wide. Um, so we this gives us an opportunity to really list them and then take a look at what actually is important to me. What matters? What data points can I use to inform my own story? How does that help me build my course? And then we have local data points, more local data points. Um, and yes, you should be seeing something on the screen right now. Can everybody else see my shared screen? No, not, not the Google document. We're just seeing your desktop. Well, let me stop share and reshare. Thank you. Now? Yes. Awesome. Now Thank we you. see the second time that it's happened to me this week. I am just losing my luster after all that COVID presenting. Man, let me get back to it. All right. Well, now you can see what I'm talking about, and hopefully it's much more interesting. Um, so our second level here is map data. And I think about it like, so satellite is like up in the sky, right? It's sort of like that higher data that we can't really see. We know it's there. That's how your cell phone works. It pings off of that satellite. It's somewhere out there and it exists. Map data is what you can chart out in front of you, but you don't necessarily know all of the points. You don't know all the turns, the stops, the way to get there, but you know that it's there and it can help guide you. So those are things like campus-wide data. Those are things like um, department data. If you're, if you're doing a department study, like I know our English department at Diablo Valley is doing a department study of uh, student preference. They gave out a survey department-wide and they're looking at student preference of, of class schedule, where the type of modality and when. Those are kind of local data points that we call map data. Um, and then we have street level data, which is data that you can access. It's the data that you know that you are most familiar with. When you take a walk around your neighborhood, that's your street level data. You can make that right and feel confident that you know exactly how to get back to where you came from. Um, so those are the kind of data points that are in your classroom. Those are data points that you collect at any point. Sometimes we collect like an end of semester survey. That's a data point for you to rebuild your next semester's version of this course. These are things that we have access to immediately and we know how to manipulate and use for the next. Um, and I do have just like a little, I, when I was doing some prep for this presentation, I came across this really awesome podcast, which is not really my style. 
but I liked it and I will give the link to you in the chat here if you want to peruse it on your own time. Um, I found it interesting, but it is about an application of street data and what it really looks like from a student perspective. Um, but we wanna take a look at what our students are doing. We wanna see what our students are doing and street level data is a great way to do that. We kind of lose that when we get really, really high up there with all the district and the um, campus-wide data. Um, so I do have just a short video that I wanted to show you. And it's, I think just like four minutes of an explanation of this in practice. So what does it look like for street data in practice? And then I'm gonna go ahead and hit uh, play. And then if somebody can just give me a thumbs up to make sure that the volume is okay and you can hear it. Right now, and they've been doing it forever. So what we tried to do in this book was to lift those voices. They've been there screaming, shouting forever, but we need to bring that to the center when we're talking about education and what we value, what we consider to be valuable as we seek to do, do some change. Um, so let's talk about what this whole idea of street data is. <laughs> let's just like define it at a base level and then we'll get into some examples of it a little bit later. So what is street data? Really simple definition. Street data is the qualitative data that emerges at the eye level and on lower frequencies when you train, when we train our brains to discern it. It is data that is there on the daily. It is not far is the moment of knowing we see in our children. It is that observation where we look and we say, this teacher's got it. It is the day-to-day -day data that's all around us. To make it a little bit more broad and specific at the same time, if you think about um, our current paradigm, we kind of start really high level. Think of Google Maps, right? You see the satellite, gives you some information, you kind of know where the countries are and things of that sort, but it's, it's high level. So SBAC scores would count as that. You get this data, everybody does all their learning. At the end, we find out that we were successful because the SBAC told us so. Here in, here in Philadelphia, that would be the PSSA, High School Keystone. Or we look at graduations. We were successful because this amount of kids graduated. Or how many kids um, you know, came to school. Satellite data okay, is helpful to some degree. But then you think about Google Maps and you go to the map data. All right, now you can see kind of the freeways. You see a little bit closer what you need to see. It gives you some information, help you know the, you know, the route you might take. And we think of that in schools as maybe your student family surveys, really, really beneficial, Likert scale, kind of give you some open-ended information. Common assessments can be helpful. I love, you know, reading assessment, to be honest. I, I, I love that kind of stuff. But it only gives me some of the information. What we're arguing is that we need to get to the street. You know, you're wondering what the restaurant looks like. Well, when you go on Google Maps, it shows you what it looks like. You can see the numbers. You know exactly where you need to go. That's street data. For us, when we think about education, that's the interview. You did this lesson. Well, what did the student actually think about that lesson? What was the impact of the lesson on the student? Even beforehand, what is the, how does the student think the lesson should go? That's interviews that we can do. Analysis of student work. The amount of times I've heard teaching happen, but a review of student work not happening at all is outrageous. Street data says the story, the work, and the broader community. It's home visits, it's focus groups, it's community walks. It's all the, the golden nuggets that are there when we train our eyes to be right at eye level. Brilliant. Satellite data, I just wanna say, we haven't made it clear, has some issues, okay? <laughs> Satellite data is a little bit late, okay? My son was in class yesterday, and you wanna tell me how successful he was, I don't know, the end of the year? I can tell you right now, my son wasn't paying attention to half the classes he was in today. But if you wanna use the assessment, you know, the PSSA later to tell you, you know, whether he was into it or not, you can, but it's lagging, doesn't help. It lends credibility to sweeping decisions far from the focus of learning. You, we all know the amount of decisions that are. I'm going to pause it there. Um, and I know they're talking about a lot of assessments that are at that high school level, but it reminds me of things that we're doing right now to assess our student retention. We're looking at things on our campus by graduation rate, but that doesn't always tell us what actually is causing students to either complete or not complete or drop out of programs, right? 
that's overarching data that doesn't give us the direction that we always need to go in. So we can start drilling down at our own campuses and think about what kind of data points do I have access to in my own classroom that can really tell me why students are or are not being successful with the material or with the certificate program that they're in or the direction that they're going, whether or not they're trying to transfer or just get something at the two-year college level. Um, and I added the link if you want to watch the complete video. There's a lot of other great points in there. Um, but I won't take up your whole time. Let's talk about what this whole idea of street data is. There we go. Um, so this is a good opportunity for us to pause and go back to drafting our story or start to take some notes or maybe even share out some ideas of what our equitable data points are that we have access to right now. If you're serving on committees in your college or district and you know what some of that larger data is, map it out, write it down and decide to yourself, is it actually informative? There might be some pieces in there that help direct you, but maybe don't give you all of the information. And then what map data do you have access to? What data do you have access to as a department, as a campus uh, that can really start to inform your process as an instructor? And then most importantly, what is that street data that you have access to? What classroom data do you know of right now that you use or would like to use to inform the way that you begin to design and develop your course in the future? So take a couple of minutes. You've got that document um, and it is still linked in the chat. Um, you can use the document or you can think, brainstorm on your own piece of paper. Feel free to raise your hand or add some thoughts to the chat as well. Um, and we'll take about two minutes to brainstorm some ideas. If you're still brainstorming, that's totally fine, but I would love to hear some data points if anybody's willing to share, if you want to add some to the chat or unmute and give us some ideas of data points that you're interested in exploring or applying.
I know we just started a new-ish program at DVC called Instructional Rounds, where we are dropping into each other's classrooms and observing for 20 minutes and collecting informal feedback. And it's non-evaluative. It is just peer-to-peer, -peer, kind of like a, hey, what are you doing? That's a great example of both map and street data, where we're getting this department-led feedback data collection and then an instructor can immediately turn around and use that in their own classroom after they've been observed and they say, oh my gosh, you're right. I would love to try this thing. That's something that can make a change based on assessment data right then and there. Uh, and it's a way to build community around data. Uh, so you can start to think about like PD programs on your campus or things like that. I know we also have something um, called ped pedagogy inquiry teams where we have created data points that are student and instructor led. Um, and it looks like we've got a good example in the chat, Student Voices Project, at why our students are learning uh, our lowest level transfer, or why our students are learning our lowest level transfer, leaving. Okay, I was like, wait, is that me? My glasses is dirty. Thank you. Um, yeah, why they're leaving. Um, that's a really good question. And actually, our new program starts with a question, like, why are students doing this? Or what what is it about this program that is happening this way? Um, and then we begin to, to dive deeper. And I think that's a great opportunity for a data point to start with the program and then build out, share that out more widely and start to make change. If there are any other programs you wanna to add to the chat, feel free. It's great to hear what each other are doing and, and learn more. Yes, interviews, narratives. We did a, um, a collection of informal data and now I think it's a really good time for us to start collecting um, more formal statements from participants to say what do they want to move forward because our next step is to take it to administration right we want to have something formal we want to have something stated by our instructors this is what we need to solve this problem so it's a really great start to hopefully something that will be bigger um, so that brings us to chapter two to map out our summative assessments a summative assessment is something that we assess at the end of a learning period, and then hopefully are able to move forward into deeper learning or further learning, um, the next step of learning. Um, so I want you to think about a learning content piece. It could be a professional development program that you are in charge of if you are an instructional designer or something like that, or an administrator, or if you're an instructor in the classroom, think about what is a unit that I really enjoy teaching? What is a module that I really enjoy teaching and my students really enjoy it, but maybe they don't always succeed at the end the way that I want them to, or I find that I have to give them a lot of feedback on this particular part, or there's always 10 emails that come in when this question comes out or something like that. Think about that module, that unit, and what is the final evidence of learning that they're submitting? Maybe it's a project. Maybe it's a test, maybe it's a quiz. What is the final element that they're submitting? And then we're gonna take an opportunity back in our, our document here to really sketch out what does it look like? What is that summative assessment, that final piece of learning? And so a summative assessment is something that generally we don't revisit later. So if it is that final quiz or final test, we don't usually go back and redo those things. So what is that like end game assessment? Um, so back in our document, we have a couple of prompts here for you and I'll put them again in the chat um, in just a second here. So using these to start to, to outline our second chapter, what is the outcome of that assessment? How do they demonstrate this assessment? And then how will you know that they've met the outcome? Just a few a few minutes like last time and then we'll move forward to the next one. But if you have ideas, thoughts, or things that you would like to unmute and or add in the chat, please feel free.
may I ask a question? Yes, please feel free. Okay, so I am a classroom instructor and I teach in the English department. So a lot more of my assessment, I, I think is street level because it's a lot more narrative based, but that's probably also mm -hmm. just based on the way I think, right? And so um, one of the assignments when you were given these instructions that I give is writing an annotated bibliography, which I think is like an exercise in following directions, mm -hmm. except it always comes out wrong. And I'm confused because I feel like you felt, if you follow the directions, it should be right. And so I had the benefit, I recently um, started teaching on campus again. So for this particular semester, since it just was the, the end result, what I'm looking for is the annotated bibliography to simply be right for the directions to have been followed, right? And so this, because I was back on campus, I had the benefit of doing an in-class workshop where we kind of went through it. Like I demonstrated how to do the, um, bibliographic part and then I broke them into small groups so that they could do the annotated part and then I went down around to each group and we had like an extensive conversation about it and so the results that I got for the homework assignment for that one were a lot better mm -hmm. however I have no idea how to do that online without that actual presence to demonstrate because again for me it's like it's an exercise in following directions but for whatever reason the directions are just not followed and it just doesn't come back right I feel like everybody here probably has a very similar story about an assignment. Like I can think about assignments in that same way too. So you are not alone if that makes you at all feel any better <laughs> as you move through it. I think that that is a hard one because if you do have a specific format, especially for an annotated bib that you're following and you want it to be that and you want it to look like that um, and have that successful outcome that it it is exactly the directions were followed. Um, and, and online, that's difficult because it, it allows us to really think more about how are we designing our course? What are we doing when we're building those pages? And it gives us an opportunity to think about demystification. So, and it's often thing that I have in these slides. And so I'm going to actually stop sharing, but I can just like talk to you all. But um, when we begin to build these pages in Canvas, we have to think about how can I further demystify these pages so that students can follow step by step. Um, and, and one way that I have helped, hopefully, um, my faculty to think about that is through templates. And if you are an online instructor, I don't know how many of you here have gone through um, the alignment process to uh, poker or gone through like CBC online course certification. Uh, but we have a lot of kind of check marks we're supposed to do when we do that. And one way that I found useful to move my faculty through that to give them a template to look at and to follow so that they have that base level understanding. We are lifting the cognitive load. We are giving our students or ourselves a minute to say, I don't have to learn how to read this page. All I have to do is the thing that they want me to do. Because sometimes courses are designed so differently instructor by instructor, which is the beauty of academic freedom. But that means a student has to interpret every page every time they're in a new class. And they're like, oh, okay, well, in this class, the instructions are at the bottom, but here I can't actually really tell where they are on the page. And I'm a little bit lost and confused. And I don't really know if I should be able to ask this question because I should already know. I was that student. I struggled a lot um, with that type of worry as a student. Um, and so I speak from experience. As an online learner and an in-person learner, it's still really hard to ask questions, ask for clarification. In person, somebody else usually asks, and then I never had to. But online, it's a little bit difficult, right? So my suggestion is to think about how are those pages demystified for your students? How can they walk through without that extra piece of how to, like, how do I learn to read in this course? Or how do I learn to find the material in this course? I think in, in like the suggestion in the chat, very specific examples are very helpful. Um, if you are willing to provide them a template to start with, I call it an F plus example in my class. But it, it's a basic outline, right, that's like not even done, but it has the bullet points in the right place, so they at least don't have to struggle for that part. But that is one of those things that our data tells us. Students are struggling here, and I have to figure out how to fill in the blanks for them. And that's one thing, hopefully, you as a department, too, can start to talk about what does that look like? Because it's probably not just you, too, and there's probably a lot of other folks who would love to talk about it. And it looks like there are some suggestions in the chat. 
along that line as well. And I appreciate that you are comfortable enough to share that experience here. And hopefully that helped a couple of people. Um, but I'm also happy to help if you ever want to reach out and send me an email um, and we can chat about page design and what that looks like in online and try to take that in-person world to online and build community there. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments or points of data that you want to share? If you are thinking to yourself, I don't even know how to find my points of data, I have you covered. That's where we're headed next. <laughs> and hopefully you're thinking about the types of data you would at least like to try to find. Um, and this is more geared towards a little bit of online here, but we can also think about what does this look like in an on-campus class, um, specifically if you are not submitting assignments through Canvas, because we're going to talk about Canvas right now. Um, Let's see. And as we talk about Canvas, I know sometimes questions will pop up or you'll wonder, wait, how, where was that? Or how did I do that? Please feel free to unmute or ask me to show you how to do that again. I am happy to do that. Um, so chapter three is actually exploring that assessment data. So we'll start with Canvas. That is something that we have access to. Likely all of us have access to Canvas. And so it's a good time for us to introduce ourselves to what's called new analytics. It's not new anymore, but it is still new analytics. Um, so in new analytics, we can take a look at what students have done, um, are doing habitually, and how they are accessing our course. So I'm going to put this in the chat really quick. Uh, this is just a basics how-to guide. If that is not for you, that is totally fine. But if you like the Canvas community and you want to access the Canvas community how-to guides, you totally can. Um, but I'm going to actually pop into um, Canvas and show you what this looks like in just a second here. So all students have access to Canvas, even if they are in an on-campus class. There is likely a Canvas shell that is attached to that class that students can access. And a lot of students are going into classes now assuming that they will have access to that because they did for so long. Um, and I know a, a number of our online instructors are, or our on-campus instructors are using Canvas to guide students, to provide them modules, even though the learning is happening on campus. We can still gather data there. Um, so if you open up your own Canvas course shell, you can see new analytics on that left side navigation menu. And I'll show you live what it looks like. It gives us an opportunity to look as a whole in our class, but also student by student, which is very helpful if you have a couple of students maybe who are struggling, we're doing well, and now they are not, and you're really trying to figure out what's happening. Um, so this is just one of our PD courses here, but you'll see here on the left-hand side is that new analytics button. So if I click on that button, then you are able to see student data, class data, all of that stuff. Um, and that is where it starts. There we go. Um, so one of those data points is course grade. We can look at students by course grade, and that's as a whole class or individually. Um, it's Reminiscent of the message students who, if you've ever used that feature in Gradebook where you can message all of the students who like didn't submit or have yet to submit or maybe got a certain grade, you can also do that in here, but you can look at it over time. So maybe you realize the student was doing really well and then all of a sudden in week three, there was a dip and then they kind of came back in week five, but then they really haven't come back since then. You can take a look at all of that at once and then click that message students who and say, hey, have you visited our tutoring centers? Or do you have time to drop into office hours or make a one-on-one -on -one this week? Um, or I see that you really were struggling with this final assignment. Um, this is a, a point of street data that allows us to center equity around remediation, um, review sessions, uh, reteaching, and it gives us a chance to maybe build student study groups too. So if students, there are students who are doing really well, and you can see that in this data point. 
then maybe this is a time for us to create groups, leveled groups where students can work together and support each other um, and begin to build, especially if you have a class that is really built on community and learning together. Um, we can build our groups this way. Um, we're looking for feedback opportunities. Where are there spaces maybe that you can go in and add in low stakes opportunities for students to give you feedback or submit extra data points so that you can see where they're at before they're way down at the bottom. Another point that we have there is our weekly online activity where we can take a look at what are students looking at online in our classes? What are they clicking on? What are they accessing or not accessing? Are they watching that video that I so lovingly put on that page? And if they aren't, why aren't they? And that could be that they already got the information somewhere else, or maybe we realize it's actually not in a, a page where students are even noticing that it's there and we need to make some edits. So we can take a look at what students are actually seeing. Um, I like the comment in the chat, the introspective writing, weekly introspective writing. I think that is a great way, not only to demystify, but also to collect formative data for yourself too because then you can use that to inform how you move forward. And it's a great practice of street data and equity and Im Im implementing that with extra supports. It gives you a chance to respond and a chance to say, oh, you know, you asked this question and so did this student. Let me address it in an announcement or put it somewhere where all students can access this answer. Um, so how can we use weekly online activity as a street data for equity? This. This is how I use it. I use it to post an announcement. I'm looking at what are students missing that I feel like they need to see or they aren't clicking on this page. And I feel like this is the information that's really important. So why are they not clicking on it? And then how can I make it more digestible? So I like to sometimes call these things out in announcements. Either I'll post an announcement with links to the page or I'll make a quick video or both. Um, sometimes depending on what course it is, we can offer topic-based office hours. So if it is that annotated bibliography assignment and they're really struggling with it, having a topic-based office hour that maybe is just one part of that assignment can give them the chance to catch up without them having to ask for help because they may not want to ask for help or even know what to ask. Uh, but when you look at the data, you can see that they've skipped that page that explains that part. So let me hold that office hour and see who comes. Um, and then more purposeful student groups for further learning, which you can tell is something that I really like to do. Uh, students is another data point that you'll find once you're in um, Canvas Analytics. Students really just shows you all of your students and how they are doing by percentage, by participation, by page views, by um, a number of time that they have interacted with the material that's posted. Um, so, and I will admit, I took this screenshot from a friend of mine's course and discussed with her kind of how she uses this. She uses this as an opportunity to say, where are my students really excelling? And where can I offer them a challenge? Those, the students who are constantly excelling, how can I challenge them further as well so that they don't feel left behind? We offer remediation, but are we also offering those acceleration points for students who wanna push further and want to do more? Um, so this is a space where we can think about what can I offer to not only create remediation time, but acceleration for students who need a little bit more of a challenge. And if I was building this as a page, I might say something like need more and then have a couple of challenging reads or link them to a podcast or something else that pushes further past that learning based on the things that I'm seeing here. You may also find that those stellar students who are doing everything are skipping your pages because maybe those pages are not challenging them in that way. And so that little extra challenge might push them back into the learning. Um, and then moving from Canvas, so we'll, I'll pause before I go here. Are there any Canvas-based questions before I dip into formative assessment design? Everybody is deep in their Canvas analytics right now. Get it? Got it? 
If you have questions of how it works, let me know. Okay, I'm gonna take you on a tour of one of my favorite things of all time. This image is lovingly taken from West Ed, um, who has some great PD out there. But the formative assessment loop uh, is something that I internalized a long time ago and think about pretty much when I do anything now <laughs> without even thinking about it. Um, if I'm creating a PD program, if I'm creating a classroom assignment, I'm thinking about where am I starting and where am I going? Where do I want them to be? And how am I gonna check to make sure that they're getting there without the threat of failure? Um, so this gives us a chance for continuous learning. We get to start with the design of our assignment, our project, whatever it is, and then think about the checkpoints along the way that get them to that end point. So if they are not getting to where you want them to go, what questions can you be asking along the way so that we can direct them in the right way? Think about it like, you know, when we used to stop at the gas station and ask for directions, <laughs> what questions are you asking to get to where you need to go? Um, and that's how that formative assessment loop works. Um, so where are our students? We're starting with where are they going? Where are they at right now? And then where, where are they going at the end? So where are they moving in this loop? Um, and the student obviously is the center of all of it because they are the one who's gonna tell you the answers. It gives us an opportunity to think about scaffolded learning and how am I building this? Um, we can note spaces for student voice and choice and where they are able to tell you what they are or are not being successful with without punishment. So that means we are not asking them to submit a quiz, but we are instead asking them for a survey or a quick discussion board post that says, hey, where are you stuck? Or how do you interpret this material? So that it, by the time they get to the end, that summative assessment, it doesn't feel punitive that, because they don't understand it. You've used the data points along the way to help build them to the end there and get to that successful point. So um, I am going to ask you to take a look here. I know it's tiny and I didn't really realize that until right now, so I apologize. Um, this is sort of an outline of like what a classroom day could look like. So one section of one class might be built in this way. There are spaces for formative assessments here and I want you to take a look and see where would you put your formative assessments if this was the class that you designed and were teaching for the day where would your formative assessment go, your check-in? Where would you check in on student learning? Starting with the icebreaker, you do whatever you do. Maybe it's a question at the beginning. Then you move to a review or a preview of the lesson, that direct instruction, getting students engaged in active learning, a little bit more direct instruction, back to active learning, and then we close out the class. Where do those formative assessments fit? And then a level up is what kind of formative assessment if you've got one in mind. So feel free to think, unmute, or drop it in the chat. Where would those formative assessments go? some great responses in the chat, a preview activity where they can discuss questions related to material. I love the use of the phrase prior knowledge because that tells me we're accessing something either maybe they learned yesterday or maybe they learned last year, right? We just need to see where they're at. After an active learning activity, right, of course, because they should have just done the thing that they're supposed to know, right? So we might as well formatively assess them and see if they did. And if not, then we have another active learning activity coming up in 10 minutes, and then we can practice again. Yes, the review, preview, and active learning. I mean, spoiler alert, they could really go anywhere. There's no right or wrong answer here. You can put them wherever you want. 
But my suggestion is to put them in multiple places because one may not be enough, especially if you're learning a heavy topic or like a two part topic. It might be great to have one in the beginning as like a preview and then one or two, maybe one in the middle of the lesson and one at the end to see really how are they doing. And if you're thinking, oh, I only have this much time, though, how can I add more? You likely already have something in there that's sort of a formative assessment or is a formative assessment already. Just making it more purposeful can allow you more data to build the rest of your story out. Is it something that you can walk around and collect? Is it something that you can have students respond online? So maybe it's a discussion board or a Padlet where you can collect the data and then inform the next piece. Yes, and I do. you could definitely do it in an icebreaker too. Icebreakers can be content related without being totally content related. Um, are there any types of formative assessments that you wanna shout out that you really like to do? given you all my best ones. I have nothing left. Everybody knows she likes student groups. Yes, she does. I haven't given you my favorite one. I guess I could give you that one. I do. I do like to use discussion boards. Um, Canvas check-ins. Yes, that is actually one of my favorite things to do, Patty. And I do it as a discussion board and I have a selection of images. And I just say, which one resonates with you based on what you've learned so far? And then that way I know. And it's like release of energy because they don't have to say, I didn't get it. They just pick the image that really indicates I didn't get it. And I can check back with that student. So sometimes it's, um, I have one that is pictures of the rock as he goes by the rock now again, he's wrestling. And they get to choose which picture of the rock most identifies with how they feel about this content as they're about halfway through. And some of them are triumphant champion rock with his like massive WWE belt or whatever it is. And then some of them are the rock when he's in one of those action films and he's like dripping with sweat and like almost at the verge of tears. That tells me this student needs help and I need to get them help. But they didn't have to say, hi, professor, I have a question. I didn't. I didn't do this right, or I'm not doing well, because maybe they didn't want to, or maybe they just didn't, but I can help them without saying, clearly you're struggling. Um, and yes, images, it is inclusion. And also, of course, those images have alternative text because that is an accessibility practice. Um, and you'll notice I've done that on here too. Sometimes I provide um, an image description for an even more accessible practice for my students. Uh, but I'm trying to allow as many entrances through UDL as possible, uh, giving that universal design and giving students the opportunity to give me feedback. Um, In-person icebreakers, I will start by telling you, I actually really don't like them. I do them, but I do not like them. And I'm sure that some of your students probably feel the same way that I do. Um, it sets off my neurodivergence in a way that is a little bit scary for me. Uh, but sometimes I like to use technology in person too. Um, and one of those pieces of technology that I really like to use for an icebreaker is called Quizlet Live. So you might be familiar with Quizlet, which is like an online flashcard system. They have another partner called Quizlet Live, which is sort of like a group quiz game um, where a group students uh, randomly and then students have to answer all the same questions at the same time in order to be successful. It's a little bit like Kahoot, but it's without that like timer that kind of terrifies me. Um, but it's a really fun way to break the ice in person and, and students can use their phone to do it or they can work as a team in a group. Uh, yeah, Nicole, go ahead. So I was gonna share, and when I was, when we read about icebreakers, I was thinking in terms of icebreakers, um, student to student and student to content. And mm -hmm. so I teach a, uh, a unit on financial literacy and the icebreaker that I do is I just ask all the students to write down um, any what 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 um, a, a memory that shaped their thinking about um, money any memory it could be something they saw on TV 
something they heard on the radio, something that was actually an experience to them. And so it's a writing assignment, right? I asked them to just free write for a designated period of time. And then I tell them that they are going to be sharing it. So, you know, if they don't want to share a personal memory, that's fine. I start out with my own about how my dad gave my mom $100 when I was in elementary school and I thought we were going to buy a mansion. And I was devastated when she spent all 100 of the dollars at the grocery store. And I, and I even explained, like, for me, it was 100 of the dollars, right? It was 100 singular dollars. And so the fact that you could spend all of them in one place was mind blowing to me. And so they, they talk about it. Then we do the share pair, you know, so then they pair mm -hmm. up and they kind of share their story with each other. And then we share out. And so it's student to student and student to content to introduce my unit on financial literacy. Yes. I love that. That's a fun one. And it is, I mean, if you are willing to put in your own personal spin, it makes it that much more enjoyable for students and that much more like of a vulnerable, inclusive community space where students say like, oh, okay, they, they participated. I can participate. I can do this piece. And then it leads to the next learning, which is, it's fun. And your students likely will have that stuck in their brain because they'll remember your story. I will remember your story as they move forward to the next piece. Um, awesome. Any other thoughts, ideas, assessment types that you want to share before we move forward? All right. Shout out to those of you who shared. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so I did, oh, I included it in here. I didn't even know that. We want to make space in our design for formative assessment and whether or not that's in person or online, you can make those spaces if you think about what does that lesson look like. That's one of the reasons I asked you to try to write down or at least think about what is that summative assessment, because when you start thinking about that, then you think about the pieces that come before that, right? So where in those pieces can you weave in formative assessment if it doesn't already exist or isn't directly called out right now? Um, so when I build a class, I am thinking about where am I going to stop and ask these students questions because I need to know what they know in order to either reteach, have a discussion, build an assignment around the next piece. Um, so I gave you a couple of examples of what formative assessment can look like in an online class. These are things that you could also take right into an in-person class, like a check-in self-assessment, whether or not it is some like an online survey or it is just a informal writing piece that they write to you weekly. Um, and it's even an opportunity for us when we are in the grade book to give them formative feedback in the grade book and teach your students how to use the grade book to leverage the feedback that you've left there. Because sometimes you leave feedback and they don't read it. It's likely because they don't know how to use the feedback that's there. So where can we make space to direct them to that feedback? That is so, so important. Um, building and practice opportunities that are optional. Maybe that is, you know, you have a five minute, like if you're in person, it's a five minute thing where you have a student who has really mastered this topic, leads a little practice session or, Online, I just have an optional practice page that leads out to other experts because I am not always the expert. And the class that I generally teach is about Google and like things are changing all the time and I don't have all the answers. So I like to go out to other experts. We use LinkedIn Learning at DVC and that's a great space for extra learning. Um, and then this leads to a street data uh, equity because we are allowing for continuous improvement. Our students are allowed to make mistakes and move forward and do better and improve upon their own learning before they get to that summative assessment, before they have to turn in that final assignment um, and get that final grade on it. They can fail a little bit and feel safe and get back up and try again. And they're working with you, they're working with their peers and they're building community while they do that. So we have our final chapter before our epilogue here. Um, Chapter three asks us to keep that same module unit lesson, whatever in mind that you had for the summative assessment, keep that in mind. Um, and then you can start to design those formative assessments. Where will they be? And maybe it's just like write a sentence that's I'm going to do it in 15 minutes into the class. I want to ask this question or whatever. Um, and how do you anticipate that students will apply their newly learned skill in that formative assessment? Is it a video? Is it a discussion board? Is it a 
um, like a popcorn discussion in person? What are they doing? Um, and then how will you use those Canvas reports, if you will? How will they do it? And just to answer Sonia's question in the chat, Quizlet Live is free. Quizlet and Quizlet Live are two different things. They are the same company, but they're two different things. Um, I think Quizlet is like one of those freemium ones that is like kind of free until it's not, but Quizlet Live is free to use. I also really like to use this other one called Socrative that is totally free. So plan out chapter three. Hopefully you've been planning it this whole time and just furiously writing notes in chapter three about the formative assessments that you will use. I'm a firm believer in not paying for any technology if I don't have to, partially because we have absolutely no budget. So if you ever have questions and you're like, hey, I really want to do this formative assessment, but I don't want to pay for anything to do it, email me. I'll help you find something that is free and or can make it work for you. I absolutely refuse. In an effort to save a little bit of time for Q&A at the end, I'm going to move forward. But if you're still sketching your ideas, that is totally fine. Uh, because I want to get to our epilogue, which is student support. Because kind of akin to the questions that came up earlier is like, how do I know my students are going to produce the end game that I want? We might want to either ask them or put in some supports along the way that will guide them in that direction without us having to say, go back and do this. Oh, you need to do this part. Oh, you forgot this part. Um, so put in those support points where they might need it on that page directly at the bottom or in an announcement. We are adding in those on the spot support moments. Um, I like to do it as a get support on a lot of different pages, but this one in particular came from an assignment that they had to submit. I didn't want them to submit it wrong. And a lot of the times when students are new to using a technology, they will. So I took them back to the instructions step by step. This is how you have to submit it. There's even a little video below this of how to submit it. I wanna make sure I don't have to answer 10 emails. How do I submit this? So I put it on the page to try to demystify and try to guide students to success. There's still students who need help and that's totally fine. I'm here for that, uh, but less students because I've provided that on the spot support without them having to ask for it. Some students are probably irritated that I include this on all assignments but those are not the students that it's there for. Um, and then you can tailor materials based on feedback. I asked my students last time, hey, how come none of you did this part, but you all did this part? And they said, oh, well, it's because we didn't even notice that second part because we had already finished the first one. And so I realized I had to break those two things apart because they just weren't even reading. And it was more than one student, which means that it was a problem I had to fix because I didn't want to have to keep going in and asking students to go back and redo that part. Um, Asking them is a little scary, and I'm not going to say I loved all of their feedback, but I am going to say that I took it and I made some changes, even though um, it was really hard to ask them. So these are just some examples all crammed on one slide so that you can see kind of what it looks like to provide that on the spot support. Uh, but we have some opportunities for, hey, maybe you're new to a discussion. I'm going to put how do I post discussion? How do I post to a discussion board right there? Um, I'm going to make things very clear. Part one is due this day. Part two is due this day. Especially in Canvas, you can't have two separate due dates in discussion boards yet. So it makes it very confusing sometimes. But then I also included that get support part down here at the bottom. And that's there every time. And it has different support links to help them with that particular topic. Um, so I'll do Q&A first. Are there any questions before we get to the resources at the end? Anything you want to revisit or ask about or further discuss? I 
love the suggestions in the chat, the explore more. And then also um, you provide them a guide with examples. I think that is a great idea. I know a couple of art instructors that I work with who do that as well because art is so interpretive um, that it's really nice to have that guide, especially if maybe you're not feeling like a great artist. I will put up the resources. If anything pops into your head while these are up there, please feel free to unmute and share or add it in the chat. Um, but don't forget that you have uh, the access to the At One course catalog. A lot of these ideas were firmed up for me after I took a couple of At One courses. I took the basic ones because like I wanted the units, I know. But I, it also helped me a lot to really think about my practice as an instructor. I already knew Canvas. I wasn't implement, implementing all of the things purposefully. And so I advocate, even if you feel like you know Canvas, take some of those basic level Canvas classes because not only do you get units out of them, but you also do a little bit more purposeful design on your part. Um, and then I also took um, a couple of the courses that are focused on equitable grading, which I highly, highly recommend. Uh, if you are interested in further designing or aligning your course to the Peer Online Course Review rubric, not only I'm happy to answer your questions, but you also have a DE coordinator at your campus who likely is, is there for you to do that as well. Um, but that is a really great place to start designing equitably, to start demystifying your course materials and really dive deep into accessibility. Um, so reach out to your DE coordinator. And then bookmark my next event. We are doing um, May 3rd, artificial intelligence. So AI is a partner in the learning process and trying to get past that fear, past that moment of what is AI and what is it doing? Um, and then moving forward into how can I apply it and or at least acknowledge that it exists and move forward. So that is the third. Um, awesome. Any questions before I toss it back? Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And again, if you are on spring break, I hope you are going to be going to do something fun after this. Even if you're not, get out there, take a walk and enjoy your day. Thank you so much, everybody. Christella, I think somebody is asking for the rubric that you mentioned in the chat. Um. Oh, the uh, poker rubric, I think, right? Is that what? Hold on. I'm not sure if that's what the reference is. Is it the poker rubric that they're looking for? <laughs> All right, thanks. All right, so thank you everyone for attending the webinar and giving uh, Christella your full attention. Once again, please look at the chat for the survey. I'll drop it in right now. Um, yes, that one's it. Um, and please complete it. Uh, the survey is set up to allow you to receive a copy of your response, which can serve as a verification of your attendance. If you experience issues, please reach out to support at cvc.edu, and I will type that into the chat as well. Um, we hope that you register for other webinars that we'll be offering throughout the term. Um, Christella just mentioned the upcoming one at, in May. Um, we'll drop, here's a, a link to um, our future webinars that you can find on this page so you can register for future ones. Um, lastly, the webinar and associated slides will be available at our on our At One webinar site under events. Um, and this is the link for um, the recordings of this webinar and past webinars we've had. Please allow us a few days though, uh, as we do need to caption the webinar. So we'll caption it and then we'll post it up. Um, and that's all I have for you guys. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, so the recordings will be on our webinars page on the link that I dropped in. Um, and then I did see a question earlier about the at one courses and, and the summer offerings. We don't have those dates out yet, but we're currently working on a schedule. So just be on lookout for those summer dates for uh, our at one trainings. 
Um, and that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for attending once again. And we hope to see you in a future webinar.